Good afternoon. Welcome, judges and spectators. I'm Mason Kutcher, and alongside myself is Ryan Peterson, Bridget Murphy, Trey Anderson, and Tyler Martins. Today we will be presenting our hold recommendation on biotechnic with a target price of $153.19, which denotes a 5.1% upside as of January 7, 2019. Tyler will begin with the business description. Thank you, Mason. Headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Biotechni is a leading manufacturer and developer of purified proteins and reagent solutions. Since its founding in 1976, Biotechni's pride themselves on delivering high quality products. Biotechni is divided into two main operating segments, the protein sciences and the diagnostics and genomics segment. Notable products in the protein segment include amino assays and antibodies, which are primarily sold to research and clinical laboratories. In their diagnostics division, they sell FDA-regulated controls and calibrators, which are sold through OEM and to clinical settings. Finally, in the genomic se section, the primary product is NCU hybridization assays, which once again are sold through clinical and research institutions. With over 2,100 employees and 300,000 products, Biotechnic primarily sells through the magazine, which is on the website, their sales force, and the relationship they've built with research settings and academic across the globe. And I'd like to hand over the mic to Ryan to talk about the industry. The biotechnology industry is a very competitive industry where developing disruptive products and innovation are the keys to success. As our world continues its trend towards a global economy, new frontier and emerging markets will continue to lift this economy up. As you can see on the screen presented, we have analyzed biotechnology through a Porter's Five Forces lens to see how biotechnology fits in with the rest of the industry. As you can see, our low risk factors are the power of suppliers and the risk of new entrants. This is because of the high barriers to enter into the industry as well as Biotechnic produces the majority of their products in-house. Next, we have the power of customers and risk of substitutes as a moderate level risk. Although there are very many substitutes in the market, after a customer or company has selected a product they want to use, they're very hesitant on changing. This is for the fact that they like to keep their experimental inputs fairly constant inside all their lab practices. Lastly, you can see that we have labeled existing competition to be high risk. This is for the fact there's over 700 public companies competing for market share in this industry. Now we'll look at Biotechnics Management. When Charles Kuhluth took over as president and CEO of Biotechnics in 2013, he brought with him a new leadership team with a wide array of uh, experience in the biotechnology and health industries. Many of the members on the executive team also have experience working for competitor companies such as Thermo Fisher Scientific. Now for people looking to Biotechnics Financials. Biotechnic generates their revenue through four main customer types, over half of which comes from their pharma, biotech, and academia customers. Looking at where Biotechnic generates their revenue, over half comes from the Americas, however, 43% is still accounted for outside of this region, showing that they have a strong global presence. Biotechnic sales have increased every year for the last five years, and much of this growth has been due to acquisitions. However, last year in 2018, they had three times more organic growth than from acquisitions with a total of 14% growth. Looking at this growth, the protein platform segment led the way with 22%, 20 of which was organic. Going forward, we projected that sales would increase by 15.8% annually, which represents the average from the last five years. Biotechni has had decreasing liquidity levels for the last five years, however, we do not see this as a significant threat for a few reasons. First, though their liquidity has been decreasing, they still have good levels. Second, they are much better than their peers. And third, they have very strong cash flows, which have now been used to invest in acquisition as well as capital expenditures, showing good growth prospects. Next, we will look deeper into their profitability. As you can see on the graph on your left, Biotechnic's SG&A expense has been increasing over the past several years. This is due largely in part to the fact that they have uh, been investing heavily in acquisitions during that same time frame. As we look at our projections for the future, we see that Biotechnic's SG&A will fall in the coming year as they build, continue to build efficiencies around their newly acquired businesses, and then rise the following year uh, as we anticipate further M&A activity to occur. As we direct our attention to the right side of the slide, you can see Biotechnic's profit margins have also been falling over the last five and even 10 years. In 2009, they had a profit margin of 79%, which has fallen all the way to 64% here in 2018. This can be explained by the fact that they have shifted their focus from their legacy products, which have a high profit margin, toward the products in their expanding, por expanding portfolio, which uh, they've not yet built uh, processes and efficiencies around, uh, therefore uh, experiencing a lower profit margin. However, we do expect a 
uh, bright future for their profitability as they do build out those processes around their uh, new expanded products. Now, for a look into valuation. Our valuation methodology utilized four models to conclude a target price of $153.19, delivering a 5.1% upside. The figure on the left there depicts the valuation methodology used in Biotechni, weighting 70% on the discounted cash flow and free cash flow model, and 30% on the multiple analysis. Our reasoning behind the 70-30 methodology is due to a lack of comparable companies to Biotechni, coupled with the philosophy that Biotechni's valuation should be based primarily on their ability to generate and use cash effectively to grow their top line. As we shift over to the graph on the right, which depicts uh, intrinsic value for each model we use, along with the target price circled in green. As we hop into the most uh, noteworthy inclusions to the valuation, uh, we, we notice that Biotechni's M&A track record and market beta are, are crucial to the valuation. Across on, on your right hand, or your left, my, my right, um, there is a graph that displays, displays the price history for Biotechni, along with the acquisitions made in the following year. Through visualization, you can understand that there's a mo momentum effect after each one of these acquisitions. Uh, ultimately, the price accelerates based on the size of the acquisition, thus giving us the ideology that Biotechni's valuation moving forward or price history uh, is going to be based mainly on, their, uh, mainly on their acquisitions going forward. As we hop to the, the right side of this chart, we have the beta recognition. Uh, this is a beta chart with the S&P 400 and the Biotechni's price history. We regress uh, both of those to find a beta that was greater than one, justifying uh, that Biotechni has a greater um, sensitivity to the market. As we hop into the individual uh, models, we find that the discounted cash flow and the free cash flow model have an intrinsic value that's displayed at the top of the screen. Underneath, we have a, we applied a weighted average cost of capital of 12.65% and a growth factor of 9.75%, delivering an uh, upside of 5.7% for both these models. Uh, the data table also provides a sensitivity analysis on this both of these models. Hopping into our other aspect of the valuation, which is our multiple analysis, we use uh, price to earnings multiple and an enterprise multiple. For the last five years, Biotechni has traded at a premium to their peer group, and we foresee this to continue in the future. Ultimately, to conclude Biotechni's multiple analysis valuation, we conclude a, price, a target price of $151.14. Next, Tyler will talk about the catalyst for growth. We've identified three main catalysts for uh, Biotechni's revenue growth in the, in the future. The first of those is the legacy products. These have already provided a solid foundation and stable cash flows, and we expect this to continue to only improve as they continue to build out their website and integrate that into their uh, supply line. Second of those is management. We expect management to continue to drive growth through their more aggressive acquisition-based strategy, which brings us to our final uh, catalyst for growth, the acquisitions themselves. Historically, Biotechni has acquired companies in their embryonic stage uh, using cash on hand. However, their most recent acquisition uh, of exosome diagnostics did not follow this historical model. Instead, they levered part of their financial position to acquire this $575 million company, and as a result, much of uh, Biotechni's, or excuse me, exosome's future performance will have a uh, large effect on Biotechni's uh, performance in the future. This is largely because um, a large risk presents itself with Exosome as one of their main products, Exo uh, XD, um, is still waiting on FDA approval and therefore uh, poses a large risk, which brings us to some of the other large risks. So the four main risks we see with biotech is the acquisition risk, the industry risk, the regulatory risk, and the capital market risk. On this chart, we see a probability and a impact chart. You have exchange rate risk, which is a higher probability as they're in the global markets, but the impact is relatively low. The acquisition risk and the regulatory risk are a higher, prob or a higher impact, but also a higher probability, as Trey was mentioning, um, the uncertainty of the FDA, the highly regulated industry of the biotechnology. So in conclusion, we do issue a hold on biotechnology. While they do have stable cash flows and strong growth potential, we do believe the market is accurately priced biotechnology, and the risks that are associated with some of these acquisitions are still 
unknown. So as of January 7th, they had a price of $145.76. With our valuation, we have a target price of $153. Thank you, and we'd like to open up the floor for questions. Thank you. This is Lindsay Strickland with um, RBC Wealth Management. So my first question is, did you take time to read the proxy statements to be able to tell us what metrics the management team is bonused by, what the most important metrics are for the company? We think about those things as investors that we want to be on their side. Yeah, Tyler took a look into their management and he'll conclude if the, on the mic up there. So you're asking about the compensation and things like that for incentives? That I'm, I'm also sort of asking, I, um, this is helpful, but did you see if it was 20% you know, revenue, 20% EBITDA, what the actual metrics are behind the bonus numbers? Um, I am not 100% sure. I know in the financial statements they do have um, the CEO is a lot higher on the percent of incentive-based rewards rather than the base salary of the other execs. But I don't know what time to And then um, this question is pretty rudimentary, but how do they get paid? So how does the company, what's their revenue recognition? Do they do it through consumable sales? Do they do it through instrumentation sales? Is there a subscription model? Um, just a little bit about you know the revenue recognition. Yeah, Biotechni has almost 3,000 product lines, and so they their main primary product is their legacy products, which are a reagent solution, which provides them a stable cash flow to go get these acquisitions and uh, kind of a stable foundation to make acquisitions in cash. Now they've leveraged their business. So they have a multitude of different products, but it's mainly based on their sales and um, research through Salesforce and other um, venues. Uh, this is Julie Gray with Columbia Threadneedle. Uh, I have a question. I understand that there a lot of the growth is coming from China. So I'm curious, what's driving that, and um, what do you feel the impact of tariffs will be going forward? That's a great question. Um, we took management's management when we came to the um, um, when we came to the management side, and they they said that tariffs wouldn't be a big deal. We took a look into it. Um, but the majority of their sales are located in the United States currently. The China um, venture is, it, the sales are growing rapidly, but we, we still think they'll sustain a lot of those sales out there, even with tariffs and moving forward that way. Uh, they did mention there was a, a larger risk expanding in China as uh, they have a harder time protecting intellectual property. So that was a risk that we definitely took into account in the valuation for a hold. Can you guys maybe just uh, provide a little bit more detail behind what exactly is Biotechni's competitive advantage and what is the value that they're providing to their customers? So <clears throat> Biotechni, as I said, is, the, is one of the leading manufacturers of um, these purified proteins and their reagent solutions. So, as Ryan mentioned, when an organization starts a research project, they want to keep their the products and the things that they're testing consistent. So once Biotechni gets into a laboratory or clinical research setting, they want to try it, they keep those the same. So their advantage is they're considered the gold standard, they have a long legacy of working with these research and institutions, and they want to continue to use the same product as they venture into uh, new research. Also to add on to that, that they are like one of the higher quality products you can get on the market. They do have great customer service and you can get in touch with the people who have actually developed the product if you have any questions regarding it. So it's those two things with the high quality product and the great customer service that set them apart from the rest of the industry. And one last point, uh, the proteins are some of the only ones that uh, show bioactivity uh, within the cells that's competitive advantage that other lower quality producers don't uh, have. You mentioned the profit margin has gone down the last few years as they've been making acquisitions. How much of that would you say is temporary issues like integration and restructuring, and, and how much is a permanent reset of the company's business model? Uh, we, we uh, I guess, explained most of that 
decreasing profit margin to the focus away, away from the legacy products which have the high profit margin and uh, much of that into the fact as you mentioned just they are kind of going through some growing pains with those new acquisitions but we expect uh, profit margins to increase once they build those into their business. One thing to note, I don't think that they will be up at the 79% profit margin considering that these new acquisitions they are more labor intensive. Trey mentioned the exosome diagnostic. It's a machine rather than a little protein. So the profit margin on building a machine to sell in clinical settings is a lot lower than the cells and other molecules that they're selling. Um, Clement Mao from Winslow Capital. Um, so just curious, is AppCam based in the UK a direct competitor for Biotechni? And if yes, what, what are the strengths and weaknesses of biotechnology over at CAM? I am not entirely certain, unless you guys have researched that company. They, they are a competitor, but in different product lines. As, I mean, the biotechnology industry is full of competitors and they all kind of have their own niche. Um, but as biotechnology continues to make acquisitions globally in different venues than they've originally been with their revenue, um, with their legacy products, they do are they, they are subject to those um, other competitors as um, what you stated and this would play into our old recommendation um, I understand that the exosome product is and you mentioned it is awaiting approval so how have you factored that into your into your forecast are you anticipating that they get approval for that and how does that play into your recommendation uh, so in discussing that with management, uh, they are fairly optimistic that uh, Exome will receive that FDA approval. Uh, however, just because so much of that, so, so much of the success of that acquisition is riding on that single uh, product and single piece of FDA approval, uh, we view that as a high risk, uh, which ultimately played into our hold and didn't push us over the edge towards the buy. So that was one of the tiebreaker pieces that kept us from buying in a hold. And I can add on to that financially. Uh, as they leverage most of their business to get it, they do have a financial headwind of that interest burden and in moving forward. So that was also in play. If the, the timing issue, they, if they get the FDA approval now and can start getting some cash flow to pay off those debt obligations, they'll be in better off. But that uncertainty of when that FDA approval will come is, brings uncertainty. Uh, do you think that they've paid fair, fair value for the acquisitions and have they ever made a mistake? When we were talking to uh, management at the site, we asked them about some of the acquisitions because they do talk a lot about the exosome diagnostic and the Atlanta, the ones that were put up on the screen. And um, well, I do not know all of the acquisitions. I do believe that the acquisitions that they have that have been successful have outweighed the acquisitions that they have had that have not been as successful. Yes, and then through the supply of their legacy products, they're able to see into these companies before they actually hit their growth stage. And so the company justified that a lot of these companies they're paying fair value for. Uh, for Exosome, that's still in the question as they actually uh, went up in their spending and took a bigger company that already hit that ability to grow. So consensus is expecting roughly 14-15% um, free cash flow margin for the current fiscal year. Um, that compares to like 20 to 30% in the past three to five years. Do you expect that to be temporary kind of thing or more structural? Will you repeat the question? Um, so consensus is now expecting roughly 15% um, free cash flow margin for the current fiscal year, um, but that compares to like 20 to 30% in the past three to five years. So do you expect this dip to be temporary or small structural? I don't think, I think that it, with the new business structure that Kumit has brought and the new acquisitions, I do believe that 15% is probably going to be a more accurate that 20 to 30 percent is a higher value. So I would not say that it's a temporary state of fact. Looks like we have 30 seconds. Yep. I'm not sure if we can get a question yet. Maybe we should just call it right there. 
Thank you very much.